pleasure to be with everyone today. I'm looking forward to this. Uh, by way of background, I am a professor in the Department of Government and Politics with a joint appointment in the MLaw program. Uh, I teach um, a number of different pre-law courses, uh, mostly for juniors and seniors. Uh, among the courses I teach uh, are a course on race and the law and another course on the First Amendment and the law. And so I'm excited to join you today. Uh, I'm really combining materials from both of those courses. Uh, and I want to help think through um, the, um, uh, the relationship between our notions about First Amendment rights with uh, our, our ideas of, about equality uh, under the Constitution as well. Um, a bit more background, uh, I have a master's degree in divinity studies, um, might seem odd, it's not as strange a fit with the other things I've done as you might think. I have a master's in public policy studies and I actually worked as a senior advisor to a governor for about five years before I went to law school. Uh, I have a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center and I practiced law for 30 years or so until I went back to the University of Maryland, uh, got my PhD uh, in, in government and politics, uh, American politics, Supreme Court, and constitutional law, and have been teaching at Maryland since 2010 and full-time since 2015. Uh, so with that as background, uh, let, let me uh, start with some general observations about the First Amendment and race. Um, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a intro to constitutional law lecture to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to certain key concepts that we need to understand about how the Constitution and more specifically the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment work. And then from there, I'm going to raise some questions about uh, the way we think about the First Amendment now and the way we should think about the First Amendment now. Uh, my charge today, as Aisha said, was to talk about the First Amendment and race, and then more, spe more specifically about hate speech. And I'm going to do both of those things. But I want to start by expanding our lens a bit and focusing not just on the Constitution per se, the First Amendment per se, or uh, hate speech, but rather to think about constitutional values. More specifically, I want to talk about the values of liberty and equality that are contained in our Constitution and how those values either reinforce uh, each other or how they compete with each other. The key question um, that I want to pose for you to think about today and that I'm going to discuss a bit is this, are our First Amendment values essential allies in the struggle for racial equality and justice, or have they been co-opted and corrupted by those who seek to deny equal protection of the law to minorities? In other words, does the First Amendment promote equal justice, or does it defer it? Here's my argument. We live in a very libertarian age. We live in an absolutist age. We live at a time when the vast majority of folks, the dominant uh, theoretical regime is that more speech is better than less speech, that more guns are better than less guns, um, that liberty is the primary concern or should be the primary concern of our government. Demands for liberty, I will suggest, have arguably overcome and overtaken uh, our need for justice. We have corrupted the notion of liberty to the point that Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene considers herself a victim who has been silenced and canceled. And to me, that seems to be a rather silly, meaningless kind of understanding of the notion of liberty. Uh, in, in addition, because of that, 
or at least associated with that, uh, I think is the notion that now free speech can be used to deprive and is used to deprive people of their equal rights. So that's the, that's the point I'm going to try to develop here. In order to do that, as I said, I need to start with some basic First Amendment concepts and make sure that we understand how the First Amendment has, at least with respect to the speech clause, has been interpreted. So let's start with the language of the First Amendment. It says, Congress shall make no law. Most cases that we look at, however, don't deal with Congress. They deal with states and local governments and restrictions by those level of government on free speech. So how is it that if the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law, we wind up with all these cases in which the First Amendment is applied to state and local governments? The answer is actually pretty simple and it's called incorporation. The First Amendment has been incorporated against the states that is to say, even though the First Amendment on its face does not apply to state and local governments, through the concept of the Due Process Clause in the 14th Amendment, it has been incorporated against the states. Stated differently, the Due Process Clause says that you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And so the Supreme Court has interpreted the 14th Amendment and the Due Process Clause and the liberty interest that is contained there to include the liberty of speech. In other words, you as a citizen of this country have a liberty interest, the right to speak freely through the 14th Amendment, and you can assert that right against state and local governments as well as, well as the national government. But there's also another part of the 14th Amendment, and that is the Equal Protection Clause. And so what about the Equal Protection Clause? How does that fit in with the Due Process Clause under the 14th Amendment? There are two arguably different values there, liberty and equality. And so we've incorporated the liberty interest, but what about the equality interest that's contained in the Equal Protection Clause? And I'm going to I'm going to turn to the relation between those two in just a minute. Let me start by doing a little bit of history here. And I would suggest to you that we really have three different eras of race and the First Amendment. The first era I would describe, uh, well, we have 100 years or so early on when the First Amendment really is not an issue. And it doesn't begin to become an issue until after the Civil War. And so I would suggest the first era that we have with respect to race in the First Amendment is the Jim Crow era. And during this period of time, there really is not much of a First Amendment either. We don't see First Amendment cases going to the Supreme Court. Um, there now is no incorporation. The um, First Amendment hasn't yet been incorporated against the states. And, and moreover, the rights of African Americans at this point in time, uh, notwithstanding the ending of slavery, are very constrained. Uh, African Americans are not allowed to gather. There are Southern codes that prevent any kind of assembly. And there are no courts at this point that are protecting the rights of African Americans under the First Amendment. That brings us to the next era of the First Amendment and race, which is the period in the early 1900s. And here for the first time, we see the courts and the Supreme Court beginning to give some meaning to the First Amendment. We see cases uh, percolate all the way up to, to the Supreme Court. And at this point in time, the court does not accept an absolutist view of the First Amendment. Even though the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law, the court interprets the First Amendment to allow the court to make certain laws. It takes a categorical approach to the First Amendment. It looks at the nature of the speech. Is the speech political? Is the speech commercial? Uh, is the speech 
um, obscene, for example. It lays out these various categories of speech and it takes a tiered approach to those categories. And so certain kinds of speech is protected and certain kinds of speech is not protected. And in a very famous case called Chaplinsky versus the United States, the court lays out this theory. And it says that we are going to look at the nature of the speech to determine whether it has any inherent value. And if it does not, we're not going to protect it. In that particular case, we see the court decide that verbal assaults have no protection under the First Amendment. Chaplinsky, who had verbally assaulted a police officer calling him a fascist, was charged with disorderly conduct and the Supreme Court upheld his conviction, saying that his verbal assault against the police officer was quote, like a kick in the mouth. But we also see at this period of time, the beginning of the modern regime or the modern era of free speech understandings, namely this more absolutist or what we would call today a traditional approach to the First Amendment. Justice Holmes writing at the time begins to suggest that there should be heightened scrutiny of governmental action against, um, against regulation of speech and that more speech is better than less speech. Which brings us to the final, what I would describe as the final era historically, arguably we're in a yet a different era right now in the kind of Trumpian or post-Trumpian world, but I'll come back to that. The civil rights era was also an era in which finally the Supreme Court um, gave more protection to free, freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. And we tend to think of this period as kind of the glory days of the First Amendment. The Supreme Court is protecting speech, but it's protecting speech on behalf of minorities and those who are challenging segregation. The absolutist view is not used by the majority against the minority, but it's in fact a weapon that the minority can use against um, the majority in a segregated society. Of course, there is a dark side during this era as well. We know now from Freedom of Information Act disclosures that um, the FBI was monitoring the speech of civil rights leaders, uh, including Dr. Martin Luther King. And were actively um, uh, attempting to thwart the actions of, of those who challenge segregation um, through illegal means, and we're using the First Amendment to do that. Uh, there are also roughly three eras I would suggest in our understanding of the Equal Protection Clause. Um, first, the era immediately after the Civil War kind of maps onto what I was just suggesting regarding the First Amendment. And during that period of time, the Equal Protection Clause was actually used pretty aggressively. Uh, before the election of, of 1876, we had uh, majority African-American governments in a couple of states. We had a significant number of African-Americans involved in, in government in the South. Uh, this was policed by the federal government and by the military. And the Equal Protection Clause had some meaning. But then, after that, the Equal Protection Clause uh, lost a lot of its oomph and a lot of its luster. And we live in this Plessy v. Ferguson era, where now the court basically sanctioned, not basically, it did sanction segregation and said that equal protection could be equal as long as facilities were, were themselves equal. That, of course, did not happen but that was the theory. And then finally, we enter this modern era of Brown and Loving v. Virginia, where again, the Equal Protection Clause uh, has some force and now is applied to begin to undermine and undo uh, the segregated systems that were in place. And so one of the things I'd like to think about um, and for you to think about is the relationship between those clauses and our notions of liberty and equality historically and how those two things play out um, among and between themselves. Um, 
I mentioned a moment ago the Holmesian approach to the First Amendment, uh, and I described it as an absolutist traditionalist approach. Let me spend just a couple minutes talking about that in a little more detail. We live in what I would suggest is this absolutist, fundamentalist, traditionalist uh, world of the First Amendment. Uh, and, uh, and the basic theory there is very simple. The notion is that the antidote to bad speech is more speech. And in this view, the First Amendment uh, is justified and this absolute approach is justified based upon a couple of different notions. The first is the notion of the marketplace of ideas. That what is happening out there in terms of our speech in a modern society is a competition between various ideas and therefore more competition is better than less competition. Ideas fighting with each other um, lead to better ideas and good ideas drive out bad ideas in the marketplace. Um, I, I question that and we, when I turn to my uh, conclusion here, I'm going to suggest that that is terribly naive in our day and, and age and that we need to rethink this justification. The other justification that absolutists tend to give for their position that no law means no law and there should be no government regulation of speech. And often they also suggest there should be no private regulation of speech is the, sa is the safety valve notion of the first amendment that by having more speech rather than less, we allow people to blow off steam. We let people get things out of their system and therefore we have a better safer society as a result of this. But do these notions really make a lot of sense in the internet age. Um, aren't these notions very naive? There's a web hosting service on in Washington state. I happened to hear an interview with the, the guy who runs the service yesterday uh, on NPR. And this, this gentleman hosts all sorts of uh, what I think are horrible sites, uh, neo-Nazi sites, um, et cetera. His argument was that he is simply promoting this competition of ideas out there and that if people don't go to these sites that he is hosting, they will go other places and do worse things. Uh, his argument, I'm quoting from him, if people want to crawl through the swamp to get to the truth, we should let them. But is that really what people are doing? The folks I would argue that are on those sites are not looking for the truth, they have the truth. Um, and this notion that we should allow anything and everything um, suggests that in fact, there is nothing outside of the balance, which in fact is contradictory to this tiered approach and categorical approach to the first amendment that started our whole absolutist approach uh, to understanding free speech. Moreover, I think in the, in the aftermath of January 6, it is not a stretch to say that too much free speech is actually killing us uh, and harming democracy. So let me return to the equality principle and think about that in terms of the first amendment. Our First Amendment, I would suggest to you, favors some speakers over others. Some folks get the microphone and some folks do not. Those with political power and social power get an enhanced right to speak and those that do not, well, they don't get that right. In one of the more, I think, egregious cases, interpreting the First Amendment and applying an absolutist approach that of Citizens United. The court held um, just a few years ago that the top 1% of the 1% get to give, get to speak by giving unlimited money to political candidates. But where does that leave the rest of us? Doesn't that suggest 
that in fact, under the First Amendment, some have more rights than others. And does that make sense in terms of understanding rights uh, in, in the Constitution? I think it's rather obvious that those who were involved in the January 6 uh, riots or coup attempt, whatever you want to call that, um, were treated very differently than Black Lives Matter protesters um, had been treated in earlier protests. And think about this for just a minute. Does anyone really believe that if hundreds of Black Lives Matter protesters had descended upon the Capitol, broken doors and windows, entered the Capitol, occupied offices, that they would have been welcomed by the police, um, that we would have had only one person, um, uh, one police officer die as a result of that and, 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 and two protesters? Uh, I, I think the answer, as they say, is rather obvious. Here is what I think, unfortunately, is often the first rule of politics, and it is the golden rule. He who has the goal makes the rules. Stated, though, stated differently, those will political power will use it to their benefit, and I think that that is what happens under an absolutist fundamentalist approach of the First Amendment. It favors those with power, and it favors one kind of speech over another. The Supreme Court has developed a theory of neutrality, that government must be neutral with respect to speech and respect to speakers. I would suggest to you that this is impossible, that government can't be neutral in these cases, and it always favors certain speech over other speech, and it favors the speakers who have the most political and social power. And it's kind of ironic then that we have those with political and social power, those that have the microphone and have the ability to get to the microphone um, more than others, whining about cancel culture. Has Representative Green really been canceled here? Uh, to the contrary, if anything, it's heightened her access to media and her access to be able to speak. And while I'm at it, let me also suggest that conservatives who whine about cancel culture are often inconsistent in their treatment of speech. Just as an example, an Arkansas bill right now, it's not law yet, but it's been introduced as a bill, would make it a crime to discuss race, gender, political affiliation, or social class in public schools. Those who are pushing that legislation actually seek to limit free speech that they don't like. Um, and so I would ask all of you to think about uh, when you hear complaints about council culture and snowflakes, et cetera, um, who, is, who is really being uh, canceled there? And is it possible that everyone to a degree simply would like to limit the speech they don't like? So what do we do about all this? Um, there's an old saying that sticks and stones break one's bones, but words can never hurt you. Um, I'm not sure that's the case. And I think words can have very damaging and long lasting effects. And the treatment therefore of speech as opposed to violence uh, and not punishing the former and only punishing the latter, um, I would suggest maybe doesn't make much sense in the days of the internet. Um, how about a tort for verbal assault? What if we return to Chaplinsky before the absolutist era and we think about the kind of verbal assaults that, that are harmful and that almost always lead to violence too, by the way, and we create a civil penalty for that? not a criminal penalty, but a civil penalty. And we're already seeing in some ways um, this kind of civil approach um, as a backlash to the absolutist approach to the First Amendment we have. I'm, I'm thinking of the lawsuits that have been filed by a couple of the companies that made voting machines against Fox News and against Fox News host, using the law and civil penalties to, um, to, to, to in my view, more rightly control uh, speech and punish 
bad speech. Um, can we figure that out? One of the great difficulties in thinking about hate speech is trying to figure out what hate speech actually is. In one sense, the very term doesn't, doesn't have much meaning, doesn't make much sense. Um, it, it's, is it more appropriate to think of it as hateful speech? Are we really focused on the intent of the speaker or is there something inherent in the nature of the speech itself? I'm not sure I can resolve that for, for everyone today. I haven't resolved it in my own head and how we're going to define hate speech from other speech. But I do think it's worth thinking about that and thinking about that in the context of, of our tort law. Um, finally, I wanna say just uh, a little bit about, um, about private versus public actors and this notion of what is known as state action. There's been a lot of complaint recently about Twitter and Google and Facebook and all the others, and that they are in fact trying to silence voices and uh, cancel culture. From a constitutional standpoint, that's all irrelevant. Private actors are not regulated by the First Amendment. There is no provision in the First Amendment that says private actors can't limit speech. It says Congress shall make no law. And so the issues raised by the banning of Trump, for example, from Twitter and Facebook are not legal questions. They are policy questions. We can debate whether it's a good idea or not to do that, but they are, there are no constitutional questions are, the questions there, they can do it. And so when you hear folks complaining about these companies and the first amendment, um, you can dismiss their constitutional claim and instead engage them in a discussion of what the power of these groups should be and these corporations should be and whether it's in fact appropriate to take an absolutist approach to the first amendment with respect to these individuals um so finally let me return to or let me turn to this notion of the relationship between uh, hate speech and violence an, an interesting an interesting thing happened on our way to giving absolute protection to speech. We saw that speech and hateful speech is often linked with violence. And I would suggest to you that there's a reason for that. And it is that we have an absolutist approach to the second amendment as well. As I said at the outset, we believe, or at least a significant portion of our fellow citizens believe that more guns are better than less guns. And isn't it interesting how often those who were most vocal on January the 6th uh, had firearms with them? There is this notion that now it's not enough to speak, that speaking also involves uh, gaining, keeping, holding political power. And if violence is necessary to do that, then so be it. Um, Charlottesville, January 6th, we have plenty of examples for that. And we have uh, absolutists, free speech absolutists defending those. It's, it was the ACLU in Charlottesburg that demanded that that protest occur in downtown Charlottesburg, Charlottesville, uh, even though authorities had said that there was a high risk of violence and they asked to move to a uh, safer location outside of the, of the downtown area. Um, the ACLU you won that case and the results were entirely foreseeable, uh, I would suggest. So I think it's also time that we, um, we rethink or at least focus now more, um, more astutely on the relationship between free speech and violence uh, and, how those re um, and how those relate. And so in closing, um, what I would like for you to do is think about these two core values, liberty and equality. Um, too much liberty, I would argue, re results in too little equality. And we need to think now, not just about the First Amendment and the liberty interest in isolation, we need to think about the First Amendment and that liberty interest in free speech.
in the context of the broader trends that are happening in our society and of the need for greater equality uh, today, e even if that means uh, somewhat greater restrictions on speech than the absolutists would, would um, want or allow. So with that, I will close and I look forward to your questions and, and a nice dialogue on this, on this topic. Aisha. All right, everyone. So if you have a question, drop it in the chat. And if you can raise your hand so we can unmute you and acknowledge your question. We have one question so far in the chat. This comes from Brian Medina. Uh, it says, given the foundations of our constitution and most amendments are in white supremacy, it says black folks weren't treated as full and valued humans and clearly are still not. How can we rely on these founding documents to dismantle white supremacy and achieve racial justice? Uh, that's a great question. And, um, and uh, I, I'm not sure we can entirely rely on those founding documents to achieve that. Now, do remember, we have the Civil War Amendments, we have the 14th Amendment, um, and it has been used successfully uh, to begin dismantling systematic racism. We got a lot, uh, a long way to go on that, but that portion of the Constitution is helpful. But Brian, you're quite right in terms of your understanding. Uh, there's a terrific book that I would recommend to you all called Slavery's Constitution. And in that book, the author focuses not just on the obvious places in the Constitution that empowered slavery, like the Three-Fifths Clause, for example, but it talks about how the very nature of the Constitution itself was based upon this racist understanding uh, of America. And I'll just give you one example. The Second Amendment, which deals with the right to bear arms and begins by referring to the militia, um, I think is, is a prime example of that. The, the court uh, several years ago decided that that amendment created an individual right to own a firearm. And I think the majority was wrong there about it. If you go back and you look at the history of the Second Amendment, what was going on there was that Southern states were very concerned that the national government would disarm militia. And in the Southern states, militia were primarily used to control slaves. And so you can view the Second Amendment as a pro-slavery amendment, allowing the use of force against African-Americans. And so we have, we have, gotten away from that notion. We have forgotten that history and we have forgotten that that use of violence uh, was, was meant to control the speech, the assembly, uh, the, the very, to, to eliminate any political activity um, by African-Americans for a very long time. Uh, so uh, Brian, you're right. There's a lot there that's not helpful um there are some parts that are and we got to keep at it uh, there's one more question uh or actually there's a few more but uh the next one is is there anything that the biden administration is now moving forward that will help in these policy areas and was there anything the trump administration did that regardless of how i feel about him actually moved these issues in the right direction um so I, I will put my um, uh, my political cards on the table here. Um, uh, not only am I not a Trump supporter, I thought Trump was very, very dangerous uh, to um, our democracy and very dangerous to correct understanding of the First Amendment. Uh, I don't need to give you chapter and verse about all the things that Trump said, belittling others in our society of claiming absolute power. Um, uh, January 6th, uh, I, we can talk about incitement and the Supreme Court rules regarding, regarding that and whether he should be guilty of that, whether it's an impeachable offense, et cetera. But I think uh, sort of generally speaking, he was, um, he, he was a pro-speech advocate for those 
on the very far right, uh, calling the folks leading the march in Charlottesville some very fine people. Uh, but he did not have, uh, I think, a, a, a deep uh, and or uh, really uh, significant understanding of the First Amendment. As to the Biden administration, um, I, I, it's early. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that they are doing at the moment uh, to address uh, some of these issues. Uh, certainly this helps, and that is the tone that is coming out of the White House and greater respect for all people. And um, I think a more balanced and new, nuanced understanding about how the First Amendment should be, should be utilized, um, but it's very early here. The next question says, uh, it starts off saying, I appreciate the suggestion of a tort of verbal assault. What's the equivalent of that on a college campus? What are examples of consequences that could be possible for hateful racist language that would be in bounds for a state institution? So uh, that's a great question. Um, and in fact, this is one of the hot topics um, at the moment, uh, speech on campus. And we've had a lot of uh, mostly conservatives complaining about cancel culture. Um, uh, I th think it was Ivanka Trump was very upset when uh, college told her she couldn't speak at graduation. Um, we also have examples of hate speech on campus with groups on campus, uh, for example, uh, putting Nazi symbols of anti-Jewish graffiti on things uh, and, some, and some more direct confrontations as well. Generally, campuses have adopted this absolutist view of the First Amendment. Uh, and I've, I've actually had this conversation with the chief legal officer for the University of Maryland, uh, who, of course, is no fan of this kind of speech, but says, given where the law is, there's just not much we can do. Um, if, if, one, if one wants to hold a Nazi rally on McKeldin Mall, then we have a limited ability to, to restrict that or prevent that, for example. Um, I, I, I understand that argument, and certainly the Supreme Court uh, has given, has, has tended to adopt this absolutist view, but I think that that is too easy an answer, that we just can't do anything. Um, I think, in fact, if we begin to think of the First Amendment in a different way, that especially where we have incidents of verbal assault, those can be regulated and they can be sanctioned which leads me to one other interesting kind of question, which I didn't talk about in my remarks, but are, is worth thinking about. And that is when, when you go to the University of Maryland, at least if you live on campus, uh, you sign a document and it, and it is a code of behavior. And I won't quote from it, but it basically says, you can't go behave badly and intimidate other people on campus. Um, and so if you were to put a Nazi flag in your dorm window, someone's going to come and have a chat with you. Um, this raises some interesting constitutional questions. One, whether you can sign away by contract your constitutional rights. But on the flip side, if in fact you've signed that kind of agreement and you've agreed to behave in a particular way, that would suggest that sanctioning by the school is consistent with the contract you signed and is constitutional. Um, so um, I, do, I do think this notion of a civil wrong and a tort has, is worth exploring. And, um, and I think we should. And I think it actually could fit in rather nicely with the way schools have attempted um, to regulate speech on campus, hate speech on campus. Uh, in order to do it, though, we've got to move beyond this absolutist notion, absolutist idea that all speech is, is acceptable and more speech is better than less. Aisha, we have a few more questions in the chat. Do you want to continue doing those or do you want to start having folks raise their hands and asking questions verbally? Yeah, we're going to allow Andre to uh, speak and then we'll go back to the chat. Okay. Andre, 
Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. My question that I posted uh, was saying, given the fact that we have so many unresolved laws and amendments, i.e. the three-fifths rule, the Dred Scott decision, and this, we go on and on, what do you recommend as the first steps to address these issues so that we can even talk about advancing equality in the country? Because with those unresolved matters, it still leaves open, you know, um, how do we advance moving forward versus moving back to resolve some of those unresolved uh, issues? Well, uh, in the first instance, uh, a couple of things you say are unresolved or in fact un are, are resolved. Um, due to the Civil War and the amendments that followed, we don't have the three-fifths rule anymore. Dred Scott was overturned by amendment to the Constitution. Um, and we have Brown v. Board of Education. Um, now, granted, this has often been uh, two steps forward and one step back, or maybe one step forward and two steps back. Uh, we've had we've had backlash um, every time there's been an advance in racial justice. Um, but the only way uh, I know to advance racial justice is to keep trying to advance racial justice. And that means it has to be done on the policy front through new laws. It has to be done through the courts. The, the successful dismantling of segregation in this country was a 30 year effort undertaken by the NAACP. Um, it did not occur overnight. It took case by case, um, lawyer by lawyer uh, to, to, to make that happen. And there's still a long way to go with respect to that. There are a lot of policy changes that that are needed and and we have to keep pressuring our elected officials to go do that I, i'm i'm optimistic at this point uh, quite frankly i think and i i just by way of background um i grew up in the deep south uh, i went to a segregated school uh until my last year in high school and that was in 1973 brown v board was decided in 1954 the 1964 Civil Rights Act, 10 years later, and still in the South, we had uh, legally enforced segregation uh, in 1972, and it took the courts to go order the school district there to integrate schools. Litigation helped drive policy. And so I think that model uh, is, is still the right one. And I'm, I'm actually fairly optimistic given where we are and having survived four years of Donald Trump. Uh, I don't think Trump was the cause of this. Trump was really a symptom of, of what we have been going through for the last uh, 40 years or so. And now that he brought racism out into the open, and now that we have the majority group whining about cancel culture. I think we have the opportunity now to have a realistic and meaningful dialogue on these subjects and to advance um, our, our, our notions of fairness and equality. This next question comes from Rachel Robin. If these cases about free speech in the private sector are decided in favor of the individual, in that organizations like Twitter are decided to be violating the free speech rights of those whose accounts it suspends, what will be the practical and societal implications? So uh, let me again reinforce uh, this, this notion of state action. There is no violation and cannot be a violation of the First Amendment by Twitter or Facebook. They are private corporations. They can do whatever they want. They can suspend whatever accounts they want. They can deny access to their platforms to whomever they want for any reason or no reason whatsoever. And they do not violate the constitution in doing that. Now there have been calls for regulation, for laws that regulate those platforms and seek to promote uh, equal access to the platform, but also to eliminate um, bad speech from those platforms. We'll see if this goes anywhere. Those on the far right and those on the far left agree, tend to agree with this notion of regulation, uh, whether the great moderates and the great number of moderates in the, in the middle come along is yet to be seen. 
in terms of, and so we may have some regulation of those platforms. Uh, the implication of that on society in general, um, that's the big debate. Would that be on net, on net grounds good, a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I, I think the jury is out on that. I, I, my general view is that on balance, I think greater regulation there would be a good thing. And I say that for a couple of different reasons. One, I believe that those folks have tremendous uh, power, social and political power, and they therefore skew the conversation in our democracy in a particular direction and usually not in a good one. Um, by focusing on controversy and crisis, um, they, they undermine the notions that we are in fact all in this together. The second thing, and I think after January 6, folks simply have to admit that this is, is a fact, that this is true, that those platforms are being used to, um, to plan and engage in violence uh, in our culture, and generally by um, by the majority, not by the minority uh, in this country. And so uh, I think some regulation of that um, uh, would be on balance a good thing for society. Now, I do recognize that there is a big potential hole in my argument, and that is that um, because of the nature of the internet and various ho hosting sites, that those folks might just migrate to other places on the web, and it make it it may make it more difficult uh, to to track them, to keep an eye on them, and I certainly think that's possible. But um, I, I guess at this point, I'm willing to take the chance of that because I think if we uh, make it more difficult to to plan those kind of activities, then there are going to be less of them. But I could be wrong. I think that answers all the questions in the chat. Aisha, do we have any participants who want to speak? I have a question, Professor Spivey. Yes, ma'am. The most kind of uproar in regards to the Reddit platform and people exchanging information about stock and this whole thing. Do you, yeah. again, I believe Reddit is a private space, but I'm not sure. You're correct. How? Okay, so... I was just curious if you had any any thought on that, considering there was this uproar about, you know, kind of shifting the stock market and using social media tools to do that. Right. And um, so a couple of different that's that's a that's a great question. And um, and and has actually been the subject of debate here since the, that happened as to the role of government in regulating markets and whether, in fact, um, if you're promoting uh, particular stocks on Reddit, whether you should be uh, subject to SEC regulation. Uh, again, they are private, so they can do whatever they want. They can kick anybody off. They can let folks on. They can, um, they can without violating the Constitution, uh, do, do what they did and, and allow that kind of group activity. Uh, the interesting question is uh, a statutory one, and that is whether by allowing that kind of free speech there, they have engaged in market manipulation and therefore they um, are guilty of, of, of a crime. And I think most people who have looked at this question have said that would raise no First Amendment issues. In other words, you wouldn't be able to defend uh, against the charge that you were engaged in market manipulation by saying you were simply a, uh, expressing your free speech rights there. Uh, because again, you have no free speech rights on that, on that forum unless the company gives them to you. The, that example is also, I, I think, a, a kind of interesting one in thinking about what I've argued is the absolutist approach to the First Amendment and this notion of, of the marketplace of ideas. Those who engaged in that were, were attempting to send a signal to those who control, to the big players who really control, uh, control the ebb and flow of pricing on, on the markets and to say, we are here too. Um, 
and so from that standpoint, if you think of it not as a constitutional issue, but just using your free speech ability in this country to uh, speak truth to power, to, to, to affect those who do have power, um, arguably it was a stunning failure. Um, yeah, they did get short sellers uh, to, to have to, to bail uh, when the stock then was at, at an all-time high and, and they imposed a great deal of losses on those folks. But there was also a great deal of collateral damage. The stock price then retreated, uh, dropped back down to, quote, a more normal level. And all those people who jumped on the Reddit train and bought that stock were left holding the bag and were losers and arguably much in a much more difficult position than the big sellers and the short short sellers were, short traders were on, on, on the big boards. And so we come back to that golden rule of politics that I talked about. Um, and whether we, the people, can really go make the rules for a more fair and more just society and as one of our previous speakers uh, pointed out, um, this is a very, very difficult task uh, that we're engaged in. We have one last question in the chat. Um, it says, is there any state or person in power, i.e. a congressperson or senator, that is really championing the free speech and equality fight that we should watch and pay attention to any examples of where things are going well by being innovative and good at gathering momentum? Yeah, um, I said before that I was pretty optimistic and now I'm gonna undermine everything I said before um, because um, off the top of my head and I'll, I'll give this some thought and, and be happy to send Aisha um, info if I come up with this. No one, no one is, um, coming up when I when I think about this. Um, I think that there I, I think that there are folks um, and there are groups, uh, for example, that are thinking about the First Amendment in the way that I would think about it and are thinking about it in the context of a fight for equality. Um, uh, HRC, the human rights group, for example, comes to mind. Um, but uh, I, 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 even though I'm optimistic, we are still very much living in this absolutist fundamentalist kind of, of period. And, um, and, and I, I think we're going to see that shift. And I think we're going to, if we look 10 years into the future, uh, I think that we're going to be much better nuanced about libertarianism. And it's not going to be the kind of libertarianism we have today. But is there a leader, um, someone articulating that point and leading that fight? No one comes to mind right now. Here's another question. Um, is there a viable path back towards an era of categorization of protected speech? Does this rely on changes in composition to the Supreme Court? Uh, the answer to your question, the last question there is absolutely yes. Um, we have, we have a dominant conservative majority on the Supreme Court, um, six to three. In, among those six, um, all, all of them uh, tend to adopt an absolutist kind of fundamentalist approach. The balancing of equality and free speech rights is really occurring on the, on the other end of the spectrum there. Um, in, in fact, um, you know, to pick on one justice here uh, for a moment, um, you you had you had Justice Scalia on the court, uh, often joined by Justice Thomas. In fact, maybe Justice Thomas is probably a better example because he is the most, arguably, the most absolutist uh, judge with respect to First Amendment rights and the least protective of of equality rights. Um, he would dismantle all affirmative action. He would outlaw any consideration of race uh, in any decision making, uh, even if a, if if a university is using that to benefit a particular group. Uh, 
um, he would make that illegal. And at the same time, he takes an absolutist approach uh, to free speech and allows anybody to say anything. And so um, until we really have a change in the court system, I, I don't see the courts being our first line of, of uh, attack here in, in trying to do the, the balancing between liberty and equality I'm suggesting. I think it's gonna have to come, uh, unlike during the civil rights era, it's gonna have to come from our policymakers. Uh, and and uh, yeah, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a matter of law. All right, we have a question from Paul Brown. Hi, Mike. Um, thank you for this really um, excellent presentation. I, my question is uh, not as much focused on the First Amendment, but on um, constructive dialogue in the classroom. And as the faculty advisor to Maryland Discourse, I know you have some experience with this. And um, can you just share some of your ideas for best practices for engaging students in difficult conversations um, so they can both learn from learn um, about these issues, but also um, take some practices and skills uh, once they graduate into a, um, a world that's very polarized. Yeah, um, thanks, Paul. Um, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to plug Maryland Discourse. Um, uh, as you know, I am the faculty advisor to that group. And, and the whole notion of Maryland Discourse is that we need to improve the level of conversation and dialogue that exists in our country. Rather than shouting at each other and saying, uh, you're wrong, how can we have productive uh, conversations about the very, very difficult issues that face us at this point in time? And so the notion behind Mar uh, Maryland discourse is that we look for people across the ideological spectrum that no point of view, whether liberal uh, or more conservative is out of bounds and that people are to do deep listening to 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 hear what is being said uh and that includes both the words themselves and often the emotion that comes behind it uh and then engage with that uh person or with, and with those views hopefully to lead us to more productive dialogues we may wind up disagreeing at the end of the day but hopefully we have um, a, a more productive and quite frankly, a nicer culture if we are doing that. In terms of the classroom, I think some of those same rules apply. One of the things that I always do at the beginning of my courses, and I talk about a lot of difficult issues uh, in my civil rights and civil liberties course, we talk about abortion, uh, we talk about race, we talk about gender. Uh, discrimination, we talk about a range of things that tend to be very controversial. And so I begin the course by just putting that on the table, that we're going to talk about these very difficult issues, issues that are emotionally charged, uh, issues that people tend to have strong feelings about, and that um, this at times is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy to work through. And so I try to set the expectations for the way that dialogue uh, goes. Uh, second, then I encourage uh, what I just described as active listening. Don't interrupt the other speaker. Wait till they have had their say. Think about how you respond to that and then engage. And my job often is, um, is kind of the verbal traffic cop, uh, making sure that people can get their points of view out and, and fully express, express those. Uh, and then the other piece of advice I always give to students um, is look around you, uh, chat with your peers and find someone that you disagree with. Uh, find someone that is on the other end or some other point in the ideological spectrum and engage with them and continue these conversations out of class. And I've had a number of students take me up on that. Uh, in fact, one, uh, one pair comes to mind from last year. Uh, he was a Trumpist and she was uh, very far on the liberal end of the spectrum. They had ongoing dialogues. They disagreed more than they agreed. They, just, they agreed on very little, but they actually became very good friends in, in that process. And I think they both grew from that dialogue as well. So, 
Um, I don't know if that, I, I don't know how, if, if I gave you Paul enough tips there, but, um, but yeah, that's what I got. Do we have any other questions? Well, Professor Spivey, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your, your energy and perspective. And we also, at the end of each webinar, we ask for our presenter, speaker, professor to give us a charge as a school that we can move forward. So just kind of want you to give us some lasting impressions on how we can move forward and just change the environment for our, for our school. Well, thank you. And, and I'll be happy to do that. My charge to you today is to, re, if you are one of these absolutist fundamentalists, more speech is better than less and, and, and Facebook should not ban President Trump, I'd like for you to rethink that point of view. And I'd like for all of you to think about a more balanced approach to the First Amendment. I would like for all of you to think deeply about how we can, in fact, use the First Amendment and understand the First Amendment to bring forth a more just and, and equal society. And then when you've thought about that deeply, go practice that near at, to home. Go, as I said, reach out to those around you uh, in your classes on campus that may disagree with you. And don't just do it one time, have a series of ongoing conversations in which you both seek to understand each other and you both seek to understand uh, what would be a fruitful relationship between liberty and equality.